6.1 Derivatives of Function Inverses First, let's recall what function inverses do. We know that if we're given a function f, then f inverse is the function that undoes what f does. So if f acts on an input value x, we know f inverse is the function that undoes that action so that f inverse will take us back to the x we started at. The way this might have been presented to you in college algebra was to think of these two little circles, let's say respectively as the domain of f and the range of f, and you would think of the function f as being a relation that would take an input to an output that you would call f of x. f inverse would be the relationship that would reverse that correspondence. So f inverse would be the function that would take an input of f of x and produce an output of x. Similarly, you may recall that we also want f of f inverse of x to evaluate to x. And this was our working definition for what inverse functions do. Two other important facts that you remember from college algebra. One is that the domain of our function and the range of the inverse function are the same set. And the range of our function and the domain of the inverse function are also the same set. The second fact was that in order for the inverse function to exist, that is, in order for there to be an inverse function, f must be a one-to-one -one function. And you may recall the definition for one-to-oneness is if x1 and x2 are two input values that are not equal, then the corresponding output values also must be unequal. So for example, when we think about the graph y equals x squared, um, if this is 1 and this is negative 1, we know that f of negative 1 and f of 1 are the same value. They're both 1. So this is not a 1 to 1 function. Okay, why doesn't a one, non 1 to 1 function have an inverse? Well again, if we think about the functional relationship here, this function takes inputs of negative 1 and 1 to the same output of 1. Okay, if that's the case, what would our so-called f inverse relationship have to do? It would have to take that output of 1 back to whence it came. Well, there are two different values that gave us an output of 1 originally under the function x. Okay, that means this relationship can't really be a function. We know that to be a function, each input has to correspond to no more than one output. In this case, we've got something that looks like f inverse of 1 equals 1, but f inverse of 1 also equals negative 1. Not a function. Okay, now, how do we prevent that? Well, very simple. We want two individual or distinct inputs to go to different outputs. If that happens, as in if negative 1 and 1 went to outputs of, let's say, negative 1 and 3, now when I ask what's f inverse of negative 1, it's clearly negative 1, and f inverse of 3 is 1. All right, so we'll definitely insist that a function be 1 to 1 in order to have an inverse. And when we have an inverse, the domains and ranges should match up. And you should be able to grasp that idea from this picture. Here's the domain of f, but that's also the range of f inverse. 
since we're thinking about F inverse as being a relationship that takes inputs from this set and gives me outputs in this set. All right, now, finding inverses is something you spent time doing in college algebra. And if we think about a simple function like y equals 3x, or that is f of x equals 3x, we know the inv inverse function is x over 3. That's clear enough to see. Under this function, if I take f of, let's say, 2, that would be 6. I know the f inverse function should take an input of 6 and give me 2. And, of course, the function that would be required there would be the function that takes one-third of its input. And in this case, that would give me f inverse of 6 equals 2. All right, so again, what's the idea of an inverse function? If f takes an x to a y, I want f inverse to do the reverse. I want that y as an input to produce an output of x. Okay, so if you recall, the way you did that in college algebra was to take the function f of x, write it in terms of x and y, and if our goal is to basically figure out what is x given a particular y, then all we had to do was solve this equation for x. But of course, we want to reserve x for input and y for output. So if you remember, the old trick we used to do was to switch x and y, which was just switching labels. So I'll swap the x and the y. Now I'm treating this y as the output and this x as the input. And now I'll call that f inverse of x equals x over 3. Okay, meaning what was the process you used in college algebra for finding the inverse function? One was to solve your equation for x, and then two was just to switch the variables. Okay, let's talk briefly about the reflection property, still reviewing from college algebra here. So let me pull up a graph. Okay, so let's say we have the line y equals x there. Let's say we have this point AB. Let's say we also have this point BA. It's clear that if AB was on the graph of F, then the point BA would have to be on the graph of F inverse. Okay, now let's construct a line through those two points. It certainly looks like that line is perpendicular to Y equals X. And of course, if you notice, obviously, those are the slopes of those two lines. And this blue line definitely has a, close, a slope of negative 1. These two lines are indeed perpendicular. Notice that if we find the midpoint of the line segment connecting those two points, which is this purple point right here, well, you recall how to find the midpoint of a line segment. The x-coordinate of the midpoint is the average of the x-coordinates of the two endpoints, which would be b plus a over 2. And the y-coordinate of that midpoint is the average of the y-coordinates of the two endpoints, which would be a plus b over 2. Okay, notice that when I find that midpoint, the x and y-coordinate are the same value. That means that midpoint falls on the line y equals x. Okay, what have we just proven here? Well, if two lines are perpendicular and these two distances, that is the distance from BA to this midpoint, 
and the distance from A, B to that midpoint are equal, that means these two points are reflections of each other across the line Y equals X. If I choose a generic or arbitrary point from the graph of F, and I look at the corresponding reflected point on the graph of F inverse, I can see that those two points will always be reflections of each other across the line Y equals X. That means the entire graph of F inverse will always be a reflection of the graph of F across the line Y equals X. For example, if I looked at the graph of this function, let's say that green graph is F of X, then I know, let's see, let's check our points here. Looks like this blue point is negative 4, negative 5. That means the corresponding point on the graph of F inverse should be negative 5, negative 4. Similarly, if this point is negative 2, negative 1, the point on the graph of the inverse should be negative 1, negative 2. Okay, if I draw a line segment between those two points, clearly that red segment is a reflection of this green segment over that line y equals x. If I do that for all points on the graph, I can see that red graph should be the graph of the inverse function. And so the principle we're reminded of here from college algebra is that the graph of the inverse function is always a reflection of the graph of f of x about the line y equals x. Okay, let's move on to the first theorem that might be a little something new. Theorem, monotonic functions are one-to-one. -one. Okay, what do I mean by monotonic? Just in case you haven't heard that word before. Monotonic means strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. Okay, so what we're saying is what? If a function is strictly increasing or if a function is strictly decreasing, then that function should be one-to-one. -one. That would make sense if we think about what sort of conditions produce functions that aren't one-to-one. -one. They have to turn vertically so that they come down and catch y values that have already been represented earlier on the graph. That's how we violate that old horizontal line test. Okay, if the function is always increasing or always decreasing, it's going to always pass the horizontal line test, which means it will be one-to-one. -one. In that case, there would be an inverse. Okay, so of course that's the upshot here. If I know I have a strictly increasing or strictly decreasing function, I know it's monotonic, therefore one-to-one, -one, therefore we'll have an inverse. Okay, now for example, how could this be useful? If I thought about a function like, let's say y equals 2x plus 3, over x minus 1. Now, of course, if I know what the graph is, then I can always visually do a horizontal line check or horizontal line test check to see if it passes that horizontal line test so that it's one-to-one. -one. If I don't know what the graph looks like, I could simply use this theorem and determine if this function is strictly increasing or decreasing. If it was, it would have an inverse. All right, so how do you check to see if something is strictly increasing or decreasing? Well, you look at the derivative, because you know if the derivative is positive, 
it's increasing. You know, if the derivative is always negative, it's decreasing. So in this case, if I think about y prime, I know the derivative would be 2 times x minus 1 minus 1 times 2x plus 3 all over x minus 1 squared, which would be 2x minus 2 minus 2x minus 3 over x minus 1 squared, which would be minus 5 over x minus 1 squared, which is clearly negative for all values of x in the domain of this function, i.e. all values of x other than x equals 1. Okay, that means what? On its domain, this function is decreasing. Since it's decreasing, I know that it's 1 to 1. Therefore, I know there is an inverse function. Okay, how would I find that inverse function? Well, again, what was our routine? If I have y equals 2x plus 3 over x minus 1, I know that I should simply solve for x. So I would multiply both sides by x minus 1. I would get xy minus y equals 2x plus 3. I would solve for x, so I might choose to move all of the x terms to the left side and all of the y terms to the right side. That way I could factor out an x on the left. And then I would be left with x is y plus 3 over y minus 2. And then, of course, that becomes my, oops, sorry then of course that becomes my inverse function. So in this case, we have that f inverse is x plus 3 over x minus 2. I'll leave this for you to verify, but what should happen when I take this f inverse function and this f function and compose them, well, we said earlier that when we take f of f inverse or f inverse of f, we should get x. Okay, if that's the case, when I take these two functions, I should always be able to confirm that they're inverses by actually calculating the composition f of f inverse or f inverse of f. And in either case, if these really are inverses of each other, I should end up back at x. And so for this example, you could definitely try that. I could take this guy at the bottom, which is my inverse function. And I could take this guy, which is my f of x. And I could compose those in this way. And if those com compositions both evaluate to x, I know I've got inverse functions. Okay, so we know how to test when a function is monotonic so that it's one-to-one -one, simply by taking a derivative. We know how to find the inverse by solving for x in terms of y and then swapping the variables. And so that should all be old stuff except possibly for this idea that I can take the derivative to show that a function is one-to-one. -one. Okay, so next, let's look at this theorem. Suppose f of x is continuous. and let's say increasing on the interval a to b 
then f inverse exists and is defined on the interval f of a to f of b. Proof. Well, first of all, since f of x is continuous on a to b, then if k is any number in the open interval a to b, we know there must be some c value sorry a typo there what I meant to say was if k was in the interval well let's just erase all of this it would be a little easier If k is any number, let's say in between f of a and f of b, then there is some c between a and b. such that f of c equals k. And we know this is true by the intermediate value theorem. Uh, we recall that if we have a continuous function on an interval a to b, where let's say this is f of a and this is f of b, now we know from that theorem that f of b doesn't have to be the larger value, but in this case we know that f is an increasing function. So we know that f of b will be the larger value, f of a will be the smallest value in this interval. And we're saying if we pick any k value in between f of a and f of b, there has to be some c value such that f of c equals that intermediate value. All right, and I should be able to do that for any k value chosen between f of a and f of b. Okay, what does that prove? Well, it proves that the range of f of x is the interval f of a to f of b. We already knew that f of a was smaller than f of b, and what we've shown now is that when you pick any value in that interval between those two numbers, you're going to find some c such that f of c equals that intermediate value. That means we just filled up the entire interval between f of a and f of b. Therefore, the range of this function over the interval a to b is this interval f of a to f of b. Similarly, if f is continuous and decreasing on a to b, then f is defined on the interval, and I'll let you think about this one. It's not f of a to f of b anymore. It should be f of b to f of a since this is a decreasing function. And what we're really saying with this theorem is that in this case, the range of this function would be equal to f of b to f of a. Okay, so notice the overall implication here. In case one, that is where we had an increasing function,
we're saying that f is a function that takes a domain of a to b and gives us a range of f of a to f of b. Okay, since the function is increasing, it's 1 to 1, which means there is an inverse function. What's the inverse function have for a domain? Well, the domain of that inverse function should be the same as the range of the original function. And the range of the inverse function should be the same as the domain of the original function. Similarly, in case 2, that is when we had a decreasing function, uh, same situation, except now we're saying the domain of f is a to b. The range is f of b to f of a. And so f inverse would be the opposite. The domain would be f of b to f of a. And the range would be a to b. Okay, pretty simple theorem that basically says if we have a simple increasing function or a simple decreasing function, we have a very clear picture of what the range of the function should look like in both of those cases. And that means, consequently, we know what the domain and range of the inverse function would look like. And it would be guaranteed to exist in both situations since we have monotonic functions. Okay, here's the big theorem of the section. Well, one of the two big theorems. Let's call this the inverse function theorem. Let's say this is the version for increasing continuous functions because we could have a similar theorem for decreasing continuous functions. So the theorem says, suppose f of x is continuous and decreasing on a to b. So this sounds just like the last theorem then the inverse function, which is defined on f of a to f of b, and we know that from the last theorem, is 1 increasing on that interval. and 2 continuous on that interval. Okay, meaning what? If we have a decreasing, oops, sorry, I just got done saying we were doing increasing and I wrote decreasing. Let's change that. Okay, so the theorem is saying if we have a continuous increasing function, that the inverse will also be continuous and increasing. And of course, uh, before we prove this, if you think about something like, say, y equals x squared, where x is greater than or equal to zero, you know that the inverse of that should be y equals the square root of x. And clearly, just from this simple example, I can see that they're both increasing functions. If y equals x squared doesn't have any aberrant behavior like holes or jumps or gaps, it makes sense that the inverse function is also not going to have any of that kind of behavior. Okay, so if it should seem plausible to you that if the function is continuous, if the inverse exists, it also would have to be continuous. Now, any pair of functions, function and inverse you can think of, it's always going to turn out this way.
And it also will turn out in the other form of this theorem that if your function is decreasing and continuous, then the inverse will also have to be decreasing and continuous. So we're just going to prove the one case. And then we'll just say that the proof of the other case is very similar. So let's look at the proof of this theorem, which is... Uh, I won't claim that this is one of the top 10 theorems in calculus, but it's a pretty big one because uh, it leads us to the last theorem in this section, which is the, the useful one that we're really after. So first this theorem, inverse function theorem. Let's look at the proof of part one, which is if the function is increasing, then the inverse must also be increasing. So what is it we want to show and when I write WTS that means want to show I want to show that if y1 was smaller than y2 this is where y1 and y2 were numbers in the interval f of a to f of b then I would like to show that f inverse of y1 is less than f inverse of y2. Okay, so in short, we're saying if this input value is smaller than this input value, we want to show that the output or outputs for those two input values are related in that same way. Smaller input gives me smaller output. Bigger output gives me, I'm sorry, bigger input gives me bigger output. Okay, and I know that's what it means to be increasing. So we're just doing this in terms of F inverse, which accepts Y values as inputs, versus the way I would usually show a function is increasing, which is looking at a function of X. All right, so first of all, let me change my color here. Okay, what do we know about y1 and y2? Well, if they're in this interval, f of a to f of b, then of course that means that they're in the range of f. Fairly obvious. Okay, if they're in the range of f, that means there are values, let's say x1 and x2, in the interval a to b, such that f of a, I'm sorry, f of x1 equals y1, and f of x2 equals y2. That's what it means for y1 and y2 to be in the range of f. There have to be x values that correspond to those y values. But of course, that's just equivalent to saying f inverse of y1 equals x1 and f inverse of y2 equals x2. Okay, let me copy that to the next page here. Okay, now what is it we're trying to show? Again, we were trying to show that if y1 was less than y2, then f inverse of y1, which is really our x1, would have to be less than f inverse of y2, which is really our x2. All right, so I really want x1 to be less than x2. That's what I want. So this is just an aside here. This is a uh, what I want to show. Well, if I think about what I have up here, what would happen if this wasn't true? So suppose 
x1 is greater than or equal to x2? Well, remember what f is. f is increasing on our interval. And if f is increasing, f would have to take a larger x value and a smaller x value and preserve that relationship if f is increasing. That is, if x1 is the bigger number and x2 is the smaller one, then f of x1 would have to be bigger than f of x2. And equality would also be maintained if these were one-to-one -one functions. Okay, but I know that this would say what? f of x1 is y1, f of x2 is y2. That would say that y1 is greater than or equal to y2. I know that's a contradiction of what we assumed because we originally assumed, I'll just say assumption, was that y1 was less than y2. Okay, therefore, y1 less than y2 must imply that x1 is less than x2. And that shows that f inverse is increasing. Okay, that's the first part of the theorem and a pretty important part. So just file that away. Anytime you have a function and you look at the graph of the inverse function, they will always behave in that same basic way. That is, if one is increasing, so is the other. If one's decreasing, so is the other. Okay, part two of the theorem. The second part was to show that f inverse is continuous on f of a to f of b if f is continuous on a to b. Okay, so think about how we show continuity. If r is a number that we pick in the interval f of a to f of b, and so I'm thinking of r as being an input value for f inverse. And epsilon greater than zero is a number let's say small enough that f inverse of r minus epsilon to f inverse of r plus epsilon that interval is a subset of the interval a to b then if we choose a y value that is sufficiently close to r, let's say delta, then f inverse of y minus f inverse of r, the difference between those two would also have to have an absolute value less than epsilon. Just to quickly remind you, how this works in the, uh, in the way that you were used to seeing it in Calc 1. If we had a function that was continuous, let's say, at a, then what did that mean? So if this is f of a, we know continuity means that no matter how small a number epsilon we pick, if we look at a little interval centered around f of a, where this would be f of a plus epsilon, and this would be f of a minus epsilon, I can definitely stay, let's say, that close to f of a with my y values 
as long as I choose x values that are sufficiently close to a. Now in this case it does look like this distance is a little smaller than this distance and so whatever this distance is if I use the smaller one and I go a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right and I stay within that interval it's pretty clear that if I stay within that interval that is if I choose x values within that interval then I'm going to get this part of the graph and all the y values on that part of the graph are definitely within this interval that is all the y values are within the interval f of a minus epsilon to f of a plus epsilon if I'm guaranteed that I can find a value a delta which is what this little distance is here so that if I stay within that distance of a all of my y values will be within epsilon of f of a then we say the function is continuous at a in this case I could say if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta which means I am staying within this interval then it's clear in the picture that f of a and f of x <coughs> the absolute value of the difference of those two is less than epsilon okay now if you notice that's what we're doing up here except instead of using x values as the inputs and f as the function now I'm using y values as the input and f inverse for the function so what changes here when I write this up uh, this is not an x anymore this is a y I've chosen to call my particular y value at which I'm trying to show continuity I call that R not a this guy down here is an f of x it's f inverse of y and I'm trying to find y values so that if I plug them into my inverse function and I take the difference between that value and f inverse of R I want that difference between those two function values to be less than epsilon and that is the statement I have right here so it's really the same old definition we had from calc 1 for continuity except I'm doing it for the inverse function all right now how do we go about proving this let me start on a new page proof uh, let's choose a particular R in the interval f of a to f of b this will be the arbitrary input value for the inverse function at which I want to prove continuity and let's suppose that f inverse of r equals s which we know is the same thing as saying f of s equals r okay what did we assume in our theorem we assume that f is increasing we assumed that f was increasing and continuous on the interval f of a to f of b since that function is increasing we know that a is less than s is less than b sorry that should be f inverse f inverse is increasing on the interval f of a to f of b so that means when we plug in f of a we get a when we plug in f of b we get b f inverse is increasing so a should be less than b which of course it is and where was r r was chosen as a value in between those two 
Well, since f inverse is an increasing function, s should be in between these two. I'm sorry, s should be in between a and b. So basically, what did we start out with? We started out with f of a was less than r was less than f of b. And when we apply an increasing function to those values, that order should be preserved. And what we're saying is this first one is A, and this one is S, and this one is B. Okay, let me erase some of this. Okay, so immediately from that, that is from A is less than S is less than B, we can say that A is less than S minus epsilon is less than S is less than S plus epsilon is less than B. Um, I'll leave it for you to tell me why S minus epsilon is greater than A why s plus epsilon is b. And I'll give you a big hint. If we go back here, remember how I chose epsilon. I chose it to be a number small enough such that this interval was a subset of a to b. Okay, here I'll give you one more hint. What is this guy right here and what is this guy right here? Those are both S. And I'll let you piece the rest of that together. I definitely know this is the order on these numbers, though. Okay, what does that imply? Well, since A is less than S minus epsilon is less than S is less than S plus epsilon is less than B, if I apply F to all of those numbers, since f is an increasing function, that simply means that f of a is less than f of s minus epsilon, is less than f of s, is less than f of s plus epsilon, is less than f of b. Let's choose delta to be the minimum of these two values, r minus f of s minus epsilon and f of s plus epsilon minus r. Notice what these two values are. Let me put this in red. Notice this guy right here is just r, isn't he? So when I say r minus f of s minus epsilon, I mean the distance or difference between these two. What's f of s plus epsilon minus r? That's the distance between these two. I'm choosing delta to be the smaller of those two distances. And if you think about where we're going with this, if you can think ahead, it should make a lot of sense why I'm picking that to be the delta. If you think about that picture I drew earlier when we were reviewing the basic limit definition. Okay, what does that imply? Well, it definitely implies that delta is less than or equal to both of these things. If delta is the minimum of these two numbers, then it's less than or equal to both of them. Uh, think about if I say delta is the minimum of 1 and 5, I can safely say delta is less than or equal to both of those things. Delta is going to be equal to the smaller of the two, and it's going to be less than the larger of the two. So in this case, I could say delta is less than or equal to r minus 
f of s minus epsilon, and delta is also less than or equal to f of s plus epsilon minus r. And I don't really know for sure which one of those two is the smaller, but whichever one is the smaller, I've called that delta. Notice that I can rearrange those just a little bit, and I can say that f of s minus epsilon is less than or equal to r minus delta. And I can say f of s plus, delta, s plus epsilon is greater than or equal to delta plus r. And that's basically just solving this first inequality for f of s minus epsilon and solving the second one for f of s plus epsilon. Okay, now, if we assume that y minus r is less than delta, we have the following. Well, first of all, if y minus r is less than delta, you know that's the same as saying y minus r is greater than negative delta and less than delta. Which implies r minus delta is less than y is less than r plus delta. And that's just adding r to all the parts. Okay, now let's put this all together. If we think about this series of inequalities and we think about what we've got right here, then based on then based on this assumption here, what can we say? Well, coming from this line up here, we can say that f of s minus epsilon actually let's uh, let's go all the way back to f of a let's just include that we can say f of a is less than f of s minus epsilon and then notice from this part we can say that f of s minus epsilon is less than or equal to r minus delta. Okay, what can we say about r minus delta? From this part, we can say that that's less than y. From the second part of that, we can say that that's less than r plus delta. What can we say about r plus delta? It's less than or equal to f of s plus epsilon. What can I say about f of s plus epsilon? It's less than f of b. Okay, so now we've got a big long string of inequalities. And the part that I'm really interested in, because I don't really need everything, uh, let's just clean it up a little bit. I'll leave the f of a there. I'll leave the f of s minus epsilon there. And let's just cut out the r minus delta and the r plus delta and just knock it down to y so that we have y trapped in between f of s minus epsilon and f of s plus epsilon and all of it is trapped between f of a and f of b. So now those are all strict inequalities, no equals. Okay, now what happens if I apply the inverse function to all parts of this? Well, we've already shown that the inverse function is increasing if f is. So if this is smaller than this, is smaller than this, is smaller than this, is smaller than this, then when I apply f inverse to everything, that is f inverse of f of a, 
which would be a, would be less than f inverse of f of s minus epsilon, which would be s minus epsilon. That would be less than f inverse of y, which would be less than f inverse of f of s plus epsilon, which would be less than f inverse of f of b, which would be b. But of course, what was s? Uh, just to remind you here, we know that s was just f inverse of r. So let's just put that back. And now let's just focus on this part of the inequality, or series of inequalities, the interior. And so that first one, s minus epsilon, would just be f inverse of r minus epsilon is then less than f inverse of y, which is less than f inverse of r plus epsilon. Now if we simply subtract f inverse of r, we're going to get minus epsilon is less than f inverse of y minus f inverse of r which will be less than epsilon. But that's the same thing as saying the absolute value of f inverse of y minus f inverse of r is less than epsilon, which is what we are trying to show. Okay, so just to uh, reiterate here, if you got lost in all that, we've definitely just proven that f if f is increasing and continuous on A to B, then we have a very well-behaved F inverse function, which is also increasing and also continuous on its domain, which will be F of A to F of B. Okay, similarly, what is the other version of this theorem? It's the theorem that says if f is decreasing and continuous on a to b, then f inverse is also decreasing and also continuous on its domain, which would be f of b to f of a. And that's the so-called inverse function theorem. Again, when you boil it down, it's saying something very simple. So when you put everything together from the last two theorems, we're saying that if a function is increasing and continuous, then again, I have a very clear picture of what the inverse function is doing. It behaves exactly the same way and is also continuous. Okay, now we come to the big theorem of the section, which is... Uh, it's really the, the theorem that we're after. And by the way, let me just point out here at, at, this, uh, at this juncture, uh, we're, we're going through a lot of theory, and of course this is, uh, whether this is fortunate or unfortunate, we have lots of sections that aren't this heavy on theory. We just happen to start out with the first section in Chapter 6 on, with one that's pretty heavy conceptually. Uh, but the theorem we're really driving for, the one, the one that's the important tool, is this last theorem. And this doesn't really have a formal name. Uh, let's just call it the derivative theorem. Or let's say the derivative for inverses theorem. So the theorem says, uh, suppose... f of x is continuous and monotone, so strictly increasing or strictly decreasing on the closed interval a to b. If f of x is differentiable, 
on the interval a to b and f prime does not equal zero for any x value in the open interval a to b actually even at the endpoints then the derivative of the inverse function so you know the title of our theorem makes sense now we're talking about taking the derivative of an inverse function we'll say the derivative of the inverse function at let's say f of c now think about that for a minute you know that inputs for the inverse function should be essentially y values that came from f so I'm thinking of that C right there as being an X value. I plug that into F and what that gave me was a Y value. F inverse is a function that I think of as being one that accepts Y values from the original function F gives me back X values. When I take the derivative, the same thing should happen. I should still get a function that accepts inputs that I'm thinking of as y values from the original function. And so the formula here is going to say if I take an x value of c, plug it into f, then take the derivative of the inverse function and evaluate it at this value, then what I'm going to get is 1 over f prime of c. So again, notice I'm definitely thinking of this as an x value, and then we're thinking of that as a y value. So alternatively, what's another way you could say this? You could say that if I'm going to take the derivative of the inverse function, let's say at a value uh, let's call it uh, yeah, let's call it C again this theorem says what it should be equal to 1 over the derivative of my regular function evaluated at what number well again if I'm thinking of this as being a y value and I'm thinking of this as being an x value this is the y value that I would have gotten from the original f function if I had inputted this value of x. In other words, what is this y right here? It should be f of this value. So in this case, what is the y value that I'm putting in right here? It's c which means C should be equal to F of something. Let me call it uh, E. Okay, so what would E be? It would be F inverse of C. And that's the number that should go right here. Okay, so just to say it a little bit differently, in this formula, on the left side of the equation, when I'm taking the derivative of the inverse function, whatever this value is right here, whatever this value is, this number over here that I'm going to plug into the derivative in this reciprocal is the x value that you would plug into your f function to get this number that you're inputting into the, the f inverse derivative. So if this y is an f of c, this would be the x value that got you that f of c, which would be c. This formula down here, this second one, says the same thing. It says if you're plugging in this number to the derivative of the inverse, this number over here should be the x from which this c value came. That is, this value 
should be the x value that got you an output of c from the function f of x. Well, what would that value have to be? It'd have to be f inverse of c, because we know f of f inverse of c is c. Okay, a little strange the way this formula is written, and you can really remember it or think of it in either of these ways. They say exactly the same thing. But what they are saying is what? The derivative of the inverse has something to do with the reciprocal of the derivative of the regular function. Now, there is a third way to write this that's even nicer, and I'll uh, show that to you in a second after we look at a picture. Um, so there is a obviously a technical proof we can do of this. Um, your book says it's uh, something from advanced calculus. That's not really true. We can do it with what we know here, but it's it's overly technical. It's it's even worse than the last one we did, um, although it's kind of neat. Uh, but actually, this is a theorem that has a very nice proof visually, and when we can prove things that way. Uh, I will always try to do it that way. So take a look at this picture, and we'll try and do a little picture proof of this theorem. So let's say we've got our line, we've got our line y equals x, and of course you know why I have that, because if I'm going to be talking about a function and its inverse, I know that the graphs of those two would be reflections across that line. So let's say this function is our f of x. And that's actually y equals x squared, where x is greater than or equal to 0. I'll just put that label there. Okay, what's the inverse function? Well, the inverse function will be square root of x. Okay, now, if we're talking about derivatives, we know we're talking about slopes of tangent lines. Okay, so let's pick some points. Let's say we pick that point right there on the graph of f. So that would just be saying f of 2 equals 4. Uh, so if 2, 4 is on the graph of f, we know that 4, 2 would be the corresponding point on the graph of f inverse. And we know those two would be reflections of each other across that line y equals x. In fact, we know this entire blue graph is just a mirror image of the green graph about that line y equals x. And so if we were to look at the tangent line to the graph of f at that point 2, 4, it would look like that. Similarly, if we looked at the tangent line to the point 4, 2 on the graph of f inverse, it would be this one. Um, if we think about the tangent line to the graph of f at that point, we can certain vi certainly visualize the delta x and the delta y in that slope for that tangent line. And we could picture it this way. You should also be able to visualize that this change in x will actually become a change in y for this tangent line down here to the graph of f inverse. And this change in y for the tangent line to the graph of f should become a change in x for the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f inverse. And of course, even though I know this is going to be a change in y and a change in x, I know this value that was previously a change in x is now going to be a change in y down here. Same thing here. This change in y now becomes a change in x. All right, this is kind of simplistic, but if we know every part of this graph is a reflection of every part of this graph across the line y equals x, that would certainly need to go for the tangent lines as well. And it would certainly need to go for these components of the slopes of those tangent lines. That is, this change in x component of the slope should be a reflection of this change in y component of this slope. And I can see that. 
this line segment is an exact reflection of this line segment across the line y equals x. All right, so what is this slope up here? It's change in y over change in x. It's this value divided by this value. What's the slope of this tangent line to the graph of f inverse? It's change in y, which is this value, divided by change in x, which is this value. Simply put, if the slope of this tangent line is delta y over delta x, what's the slope of this tangent line? It's delta x over delta y. It's the reciprocal. All right, so here's the simpler way to think about this instead of those rather complicated formulas we had before. If I just think about our picture here, and give me one second, and we'll just insert a graph, if I can remember how to do it. Okay, say this is the origin. So, of course, if I was graphing x squared, it would be 1, 1, it would be 2, 4, and so on. There would be the graph of the inverse, or the, the f of x function. The square root graph would be 1, 1, and 4, 2, so it would look something like this. And so the idea is what? If we're saying this is y equals f of x, uh, we know we can get... So if we were to draw our tangent line, let's say, where of course we had our delta x and our delta y, we know that we can solve this equation for x. When I do, I'm going to get x equals some function of y. We know that's going to end up being the inverse function. And then of course we switch the x and the y to graph everything so that x is standardized as the input. But let's say we didn't do that. When I'm looking at y equals f of x, I know that dy dx, let me do that in red, I know that dy dx would be the slope of the graph of y equals f of x. Okay, now when I think about x equals g of y, I could ask the question, what is dx dy? And of course, that implies that I'm treating x as a function of y, and I'm asking, what is the rate of change of x with respect to y? Well, if I were to turn this sideways and think about this as being my output in the x direction, and this being my input, in the y direction, then when I ask dx dy, I'm definitely asking the slope of that tangent line uh, in terms of the rate of change of x, which is the output, with respect to y, which is the input. Well, when I do that, it's clear that the change in output is delta x, and the change in input is delta y which means that rate of change would be delta x over delta y. Okay, which means what? Depending on whether I'm viewing this as y is a function of x or x is a function of y, when I calculate the two derivatives from these two perspectives, what do I get? I get reciprocals. I get that dy dx is the slope of this graph when I'm asking what the rate of change of y with respect to x is. And obviously dx dy is when I've expressed x in terms of y and I'm asking what's the rate of change of x with respect to y. Well, again, just to say it one more time, dy dx in this picture is delta y over delta x. But dx dy is delta x over delta y those two are reciprocals of each other. Okay, what that means is the other way, let's say the uh, simplest version or the nice version, 
is simply that if I want to know what dx dy is, it's simply the reciprocal of dy dx. I just have to be careful what numbers I'm plugging in though. When I say dx dy equals 1 over dy dx, I have to remember that when I calculate dx dy, I'm going to be calculating that at some y value. Let's say y equals a. Our derivative formula says that that derivative should be equal to what? 1 over dy dx evaluated, let's say, at some x equals b. Okay, now here in a nutshell is what this theorem is saying for us. That dx dy is the reciprocal of dy dx. dx dy would accept an input of a, which would be a y value. dy dx would accept an input of b, which I would treat as an x value. And the question is, what's the relationship between a and b? The relationship is that f of b is equal to a. Or, if you like, f inverse of a is equal to b. So of course this is a very nice easy to follow formula which it's super easy because it looks like you're just flipping dy dx to get dx dy. You just have to be careful about what you're plugging into those two derivatives. The two numbers you plug in have to match up in this way for this to make sense. Okay let's look at a couple of quick examples because now we're sort of down to the uh, easy part. So first of all, let's just do a generic example just to make sure this uh, is working out. So actually, let's go back to our example of y equals square root of x. Uh, note, of course, that x is greater than or equal to 0, and so is y with this function. And of course, we can do this two ways. First of all, let's think about if y is square root of x, then we know what the inverse function is. And so of course, I'm thinking of this as being y equals square root of x. I'm thinking about this one over here being x equals y squared. What's dx dy? It should be 2y. But what's y? It's square root of x. So that means dx what dy is 2 times square root of x. Okay, what's dy dx taken directly from y equals square root of x. Well, it's the derivative of square root of x with respect to x, which is 1 over 2 square root of x, which is certainly the reciprocal of dx dy. So it looks like with this simple derivative, this definitely appears to be working. Now, if I had just used this directly without computing both of these derivatives separately, I could have just said dx dy is simply 1 over f prime of x. And in this case, that would be 1 over 1 over 2 square root of x, which would be 2 square root of x. And that confirms that the derivative of my inverse function will be 2 square root of x. And that's really the, the other way of thinking about it. Okay, let's do something with numbers. Um, here's a pretty standard problem. Let's find the derivative of the inverse function at 3 if f of x equals x cubed plus 3x minus 1. All right. If I'm looking for the derivative of the inverse function at 3, my derivative theorem says that that should be equal to the reciprocal 
of the derivative of f at some value. Okay, notice what that value should be. Again, if this is really something I'm thinking of as being a y value being plugged into f inverse, the value that goes here should be the x that corresponds to that y value. So if I'm going to calculate the derivative of the inverse function at y equals 3, I can do it by using this formula by doing 1 over the derivative of f at the x value, whatever that x value is, that gets me an output of 3. So to use this theorem, what do I need to know? I need to know when is f of x equal to 3. In other words, when is x cubed plus 3x minus 1 equal to 3? All right, now, you know, this is the sort of problem they like to make up in these books. Uh, you should realize that it's very difficult to solve a cubic equation like this. There is a cubic equation, uh, but we hardly ever use that. It's not taught in algebra classes. So generally, cubic equations are very hard to solve. If you did equations like this in college algebra, this is where you had to use synthetic division and Descartes' rule of signs and so on to try and find the solution. Um, in this problem, much like the ones in the book, he's trying to give you a function and an output value for which it's fairly easy to determine the x uh, just by sort of looking at the function for a second. And it should be clear that x equals 1 is the x value that will do this. Also, it wouldn't be too hard for you to confirm that that's the only x value. Um, if you take the derivative of this function, you can confirm for yourself that it's 1 to 1. If it's 1 to 1, that means this will be the only x value that will get you a y value of 3. Okay, so if that makes sense to you, what we're saying is the x value that should go right there is 1. And that's because f of 1 equals 3. And that's always the correspondence I should see between these two values. All right, now, here's the thing. You, you should see why I chose this example. And of course, we could do several of these examples, but really just seeing one or two gets you the idea. This should be pretty easy to do because if f of x is x cubed plus 3x minus 1, I know f prime is just going to be 3x squared plus 3, which means f prime of 1 is just going to be 3 times 1 squared plus 3, which means it would be 6, which means the derivative of the inverse function at an input of 3 is 1 over 6. So the answer is 1 sixth. Do you see the trouble I would have to have, or I would have, if I treated f of x as y, and I asked you to find the derivative of the inverse manually by finding the inverse, that is, mechanically finding the inverse. I guess that's supposed to be minus 1 there. That is, could I solve this for x and get x in terms of y and then switch the x and the y to get my inverse function? And then from there, take the derivative of my inverse function by using the power rule or whatever rule applies. Well, that's great, but am I able to solve that equation for x very easily? And the answer is absolutely not. So you start to see now what part of the power of this theorem is. It allows me to find the derivative of the inverse function without actually finding the inverse function. In this example, we found the derivative of the inverse at the input value of 3, not by actually going through the process of finding the inverse function and then finding its derivative directly, but instead by finding the reciprocal of the derivative of just plain f.
the only thing we had to do was figure out what was the x value that corresponded to that given y value. And at worst, that involves solving an equation. And in this case, it's one where it wasn't too hard to uh, sniff out what the x was that gave you a y value of 3. Okay, let's do one last example uh, just to show you that we can also do implicit differentiation with this. So suppose I had 2x squared minus 3xy plus 1 equals 0. Let's find dy dx and then let's find dx dy directly and let's just confirm that these two are reciprocals of each other. So of course if I'm going to do dy dx I should take the derivative with respect to x implicitly. So when I take the derivative term by term I would get 4x. Uh, notice that this would be a product rule. So I would take the derivative and get minus 3y minus 3x times dy dx equals 0. That means 4x minus 3y over 3x is equal to dy dx. Okay, now I just wanted to do this again to illustrate that even with implicit differentiation, this still works. If I were to take dx dy, that means I'm going to take the derivative with respect to y. Okay, that means when I take the derivative on this first term, I treat that x as a function of y, which means there's a chain rule there. First the 2 comes down and makes it 4x, but if x is a function of y, there would have to be a dx dy there. Minus 3 dx dy times y minus 3x times dy dy because when I get to that part of the product rule, the derivative of y with respect to y would be 1. Okay, what does that give you? It gives you dx dy times 4x minus 3y equals 3x. And that gives you dx dy equals 3x over 4x minus 3y. And of course, we're just confirming that for this function, when I calculate dy dx and I calculate dx dy implicitly, each one is really a reciprocal of the other. Okay, I think that's it for this section. Let me know if you have questions.